Those of you who are parents will, will totally understand this. If you see your kids every day, it's hard to see growth. And then the grandparents come to town and they're like, oh, look how much he's grown. Jack Walker Tuttle, our grandson, was two yesterday. And um, the other grandparents are hanging out with them instead of us. But I'm not bitter about that. I'm glad to be here. The same, same is true with the seminary. 37 years ago, we left here. Um, I'm, I'm telling you what, even in this room, this is a lot more accurate preview of what heaven is going to look like than it was when I was a student. So encouraging to be here. E even the worship. Who, who knew that sopranos and altos actually sound better when added into the choir than a bunch of guys like we had back then? <laughs> who knew? And I'm so delighted to see the, the progress of the seminary and to see the engagement by the faculty. No, it's not perfect. Of course it's not. If it were, you and I would mess it up when we show up. Um, but God is at work in serious ways here. I want to invite you to uh, Saturday, the walk through the Old Testament we now call OT Live. Be over in Lamb from 9 to noon, especially if you have any interest in someday teaching, walk through the Bible. Um, if you haven't heard about that already this week, I, I hope that you'll explore that opportunity because there's, there's just some great there's some great places that you could plug it in. And we need instructors not my age only. So um, please join us. You can register online, walkthrough.org slash events, and then you can, you can find the one for Dallas Seminary or just show up Saturday. And kids will love it too. So if you have, uh, if you have kids, bring them along with you. Um, one resource, uh, one thing I want to mention to you is we have a quarterly magazine called Pathways. Grab one of these off the table. It'll, it'll let you stay current with what Walk Through the Bible is doing and pray for us. But I want to tell you about a resource that you can use whether you become a Walk Through instructor or not. And, and here it is right here. This is what we call our keyword learning system. My kids at a young age could go, Genesis, Numbers, Jeremy, Dash, Genesis, Great. That's a good start. But isn't it even better to know what's in each of those books of the Bible? That's one of the distinctives of DTS is you actually spend some time in every book of the scripture um, during your, especially if, if you're THM. But we wanted to make that accessible to all people. And so we decided to take the name of a book and what the book's about, put them in a picture, bring them in our mind through a cartoon, and then you never forget them. And we developed these originally for kids but I got a thank you note from a guy who had said, I would have failed my ordination exam because some guy goes, could you briefly summarize the argument of the book of Habakkuk? And, and I pictured your cartoon for that. He goes, I owe you big time. So there's coloring book version of this. There's also, there's also these flashcards. You can get the PowerPoint. Now, what book of the Bible is this? Not a trick question. Genesis. The questions are going to be more difficult as our semester progresses. This is designed to build early confidence in you as learners. What, what do you notice is strange about Genesis here? And is it small? No, it's big because Genesis is the book of big innings. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, wait, just pace yourself. They get much worse. What book? Exodus. They stirred up a lot of exit dust on their way out of the land of Egypt. That's why it's called Exodus. Uh, the book literally means exit. We have exits that are clearly marked here, and um, hopefully we won't need to use them from a crash landing during my message. You, so the key word of Exodus is exit. That's what the book means. Some of them are not smiling. They're frowning. Why would they possibly be frowning? Because they miss their mummies. See? <laughs> These are like, these are like 100% bad dad joke approved. So, oh, 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 this is a harder one. Guy on the bottom right, what is he doing? He's kissing his foot. Which foot? His left foot. So make it a sentence. He's giving his. What did you say? Yes, the well-known book of left foot a kiss. Some pronounce it Leviticus. Which, as you can see from what he's holding, it's about the offerings and feasts. Five offerings, seven feasts, 12 ways to communicate their gratitude back to God. There are also some hidden, 
hidden teachings in these. For instance, do you know how they decide who got to be the Levites? It's based on their genes. So there you go. <laughs> what animal is this? Donkey. Give me another name for donkey, remembering you're in a place of worship. <laughs> Stubborn as a? I know it's not technically a donkey. Close enough. What's this mule made of? So it's a? You only see one of them? I'll bet that's the book of First Samuel. It's obviously about one of Israel's kings, but which king? What's he holding? Saul. King Saul, who had, by the way, no heart for God. <laughs> so we, we have those for the Old Testament. Here you go. Look this way. Hey. We also have them for the New Testament. I'll show you a few of these. Hmm, what boat? Ark, but what letter is on it? So it's um, Mark, right. Mark doesn't present Jesus as the king like Matthew. He presents him. What's that guy doing? Servant. I told you they get worse. What book? What tool is that? Acts. And we learn about some, you know, branch offices that were established and some splinter groups that were barking up the wrong tree and all sorts of things. It's about building the church, the book of Acts. Uh, this is a hard one. What's he doing? He's got that skillet. Those aren't pancakes. Those are ends. So what's he doing? He's flipping ends. Right. Philippians. And you see the happy bull there. He's humming. It's about being happily humble. One more and then I will stop the torture. What vegetable is this? Pea. Good. What's coming out of his eye? So it's a? There's only one of them. Must be? First Peter, why is he crying? Because he's in pain. But be encouraged, it's pain with a porpoise. <laughs> Father, now as we look at that, that very book, as we continue our, our little series that we begin Tuesday and conclude it today, Father, give us insight into how you brought Simon Peter back from the worst failure he could have ever contemplated. Encourage us today as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes the end turns out to just be the beginning. How many of you were here Tuesday? Okay, good. You know we left Simon Peter in a mess. It was a mess of his own creation. Everybody else may deny you. I never will. And Jesus allowed failure to come into his life to move him back to the place of humility of get away from me for I'm a sinful man. Well, God loved him enough to do that for him, but he also loves him enough not to leave him in that situation. We find that his life is really four acts. There's the, the first act, his initial call and the encouragement. He's the one who gets out of the boat. He's the one who says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, act two. This isn't just a flat tire. I mean, all the wheels fall off the cart. He denies Jesus three times. We pick up the story now in Act 4. At the, at the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, who stands up boldly and testifies? It's Simon Peter. He's back. Our boy is back. That's encouraging, but it's not all that surprising because he's always been bold, maybe even brash. The surprise, though, is other things he does. When I go around the world for Walk Through the Bible, as I mentioned, we have ministry in about 130 countries. I haven't been to near all of those, but regional hubs where we gather our leaders, our trainers together. I love to ask people, what's your favorite book of the Bible? In the U.S., there's not a dominant answer. Around the world, especially where the church is hurting, this is by far the dominant answer, the book of 1 Peter. It's written to the suffering church. Who wrote 1 Peter? Peter. What's the theme of the book? Let's see. One P tear. Pain with a? Porpoise. Purpose. Why would you say porpoise? It's purpose. I don't understand where you got that. 
he's the one who writes this. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Of all the people, of all the people God could have chosen, no way earlier in his life would you have predicted Peter would be the one who cares this, carries this sensitive, compassionate message. He's not just back. He's better than he ever was before. At the risk of being political, I think, I think this is where the theme Build Back Better came from. Got plagiarized right out of the life of Simon Peter. Well, question though is what happened between Act 2 and Act 4? Again, not a trick question. What do you think happened? Act 3. And that's what we want to look at today. Peter, after his denial, remember, he's scattered. So are the other disciples. Don't miss that. The women go to anoint Jesus, and he's not there. An angel says, don't be alarmed. By the way, don't, don't use the clip art that has angels, like from Hallmark cards. <laughs> L- little Cupid. These are mighty warriors dressed for battle. Why so many times does an angel start with, don't be afraid? Because they're scary beings. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples. Notice this detail. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Wow. What's that mean? I think it means Peter viewed himself as no longer one of Jesus' closest friends because of his failure. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Principle for us, becoming a disciple means we must remember no matter how far we wander, Jesus is still eager to meet with us. It's God who went searching for our Adam in the garden, not Adam searching for God. Afterward, this is where it gets so good. John 21, if you have your Bible, open up to it. It's, it's on the screen, but you may want to scribble some things down. John chapter 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. So he's appeared a couple of times before this by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. After, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. A question. I don't know the answer to this, but someday I want to ask Simon Peter this question. Was that good news or bad news? When they said, we'll go with you. Well, you might want the help. We do say misery loves company. <clears throat> but one of the things, and I'll bet you've walked with the Lord long enough to have experienced this, and you'll see this, the, see this a lot in the ministries that you move into. One of Satan's greatest tools is isolation. When chapel moved from being a joy for me to as I was here longer, it became an obligation. What's that indicate? It didn't indicate chapel suddenly stunk. It meant I was hurting spiritually. It's going to be a very dry place. Seminary does a way better job now getting you in small groups. There's the faculty is, is, is engaged with students. That's all so important because Satan always isolates. When I blew my appendix a few years ago, all these people wanted to come see me in the hospital. I didn't want to see a one of them. 
A month later, I got all full of abscesses and had to be hospitalized again for over a week. Our board chair, who's a retired heart surgeon, is like, Phil, I know God's just there in the hospital room with you. I can't wait to hear the messages that he's birthing in your heart while he's slowed you down. I'm learning a lot. Like, this room is way too small and hospital food stinks. Want me to preach on that? I didn't say that to him. He's my boss. I wanted my wife there, my kids, e e even close friends. I'm like, tell, Ellen, tell them the hospital doesn't allow visitors. It wasn't true. It wasn't during COVID. I didn't want to see anybody. If you're wired like me personality-wise, you understand. Simon Peter, he may have gone, come on, guys. I don't know, but I want to ask him that. So they went out that night and got into the boat, but that night they caught what? Nothing. Nothing. How many of you like to fish? Raise your hands. I'm sure you got a lot of time to do that here during seminary. There's three things every fisherman hates. Our son, really good hunter, um, bow hunter, really good fisherman. Three things Philip hates. All fishermen I know hate these three things. Number one is to catch nothing. You know the problem with nothing is you can't even exaggerate nothing. You triple nothing and it's still zero. At least if you catch a little one, you can exaggerate. You can embellish. I asked Philip one time, how do you do? He goes, didn't get skunked. I said, so is that one or two you caught? He goes, one. I go, how big? He goes like this. Now let, let's analyze this for a minute. <laughs> I, I, I said, I said well, Philip, was it this big or was it this big? And he goes, it was this big. I was just trying to focus your eyes on that over there. I thought for a second God was calling him to preach when he did that. We hate to catch nothing. You know the next thing we hate? It's right here. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's the second thing we hate. It's bad enough to get skunked. And then somebody goes, how'd you do? <laughs> I don't want to be asked that. Third thing. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and then you will find some. Yeah, because that's how fishing works. Because, I mean, the fish can't move like six feet, right? <laughs> My brother and I and our wives fished five days in Oregon once at Crane Prairie. Five days. We caught zero fish in five days. We're, we're pulling the boat in the last time, getting ready to turn it back in where we'd rented it. It's so embarrassing. We're, we're doing like a scrapbook for my parents. We called it the Be Careful Brothers, and we posed in every possible dangerous-looking situation just to torment my mom and dad because my mom had said, Be careful a few too many times. And all of a sudden we realize we're taking our final picture and Ellen isn't there. And she's gone over, there's a boat pulled in right next to us and they have a huge stringer of fish. And my wife, who's a lot bolder than I am, she um, has gone over there and pretty soon she's coming back lugging this stringer of fish to borrow for our pictures. <laughs> I'm still searching for my man card, it was lost that day. So my brother and I, we have the pictures, we're like, so embarrassing. These guys go, should have used, let's see, what was it? It was a salmon egg and a cheese marshmallow. Well, thanks for sharing that at the end of day five. Bad enough to not catch anything, then have somebody ask you about it, and then they go, oh, here's what you're doing wrong. What does the son of a carpenter know about fishing anyway? Wood floats and makes good bobbers. That's about all he knows. But he says, cast your net on the other side of the boat and then you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Does this sound vaguely familiar to you at all? I mean, this is a flashback of when Simon Peter first met Jesus. Right there in the, in the same place, the same basic series of events. Becoming a disciple sometimes means going back to where we began with Jesus. A similar idea to what John talks about in Revelation too, about 
when you lose your first love. Go back to the works you used to do, even if the motions aren't there yet. Sometimes I put our treasure someplace and my heart will sometimes follow the treasure. Where your heart is, there will your treasure also be. That can go in both orders. Becoming a disciple sometimes means going back to where we began with Jesus. Had the opportunity last time I was down here in Dallas or a couple times ago, went by both apartments that we lived in when we were in seminary. The first one now has been torn down, which is not a bad thing, actually. The other one is, is still, I bet some of you probably live there, on Larmand up where Skillman and Abrams come together. We lived there three years. My next preaching assignment was in Illinois, and I got to see both houses we lived in while we pastored in Illinois. Then came back to Atlanta, and I thought, well, I can't break the streak now. I went past the house we lived in about 10 years in Atlanta and then the one we've lived in the last 15 years. I encourage you to take a trip like that sometime. Or even if you just go to one place. I, I, I wept, I really did, at all those places, especially, especially here. Celebrating what it was like to be newlywed, struggling through school, not, not, enough, not enough money. My parents said, we wanna, we wanna pay for your, your education in seminary. The same parents who thought I was totally out of God's will when I left pre-med. What about our dreams for you? And then they rewrote history. You have parents who do that? He used to sit on our lap and wave his arms. We've known he was going to preach since he was like three. It's like, wait a minute. That's not the story I heard halfway through college. And my wife, a woman of greater faith still than I have, goes, no. I go, no what? They offered to pay for seminary. She goes, no. Don't you want to ex experience God's provision like all the stories we've heard? I go, we just did. <laughs> and I was a newlywed, and I knew the wisdom. I knew that she receives like satellite dish channels, and I had rabbit ears at the time and got three good channels. Some of you don't know what that is. But she hears things from God I don't hear. And I went, you know what? We, we'd rather you invest that money with somebody else. They actually were hurt by that. But the way God provided for us, she was right. In our case, don't call your parents. Okay? <laughs> it's not the application from this necessarily. But to retrace those steps and see the faithful hand of God throughout all of our, all of our experience. Now married 41 years in December. The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's code for John. He's a humble guy. He doesn't go, then I. He simply says the disciple whom Jesus loved, of course he wasn't the only one, said to Peter, it is the Lord. They recognized Jesus. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he, that's Simon Peter, wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped in the water. Again, I want to ask Peter, did you think you would just skim across the top? I'll bet he did. Because if Jesus is alive, I can't sink for sure now. Don't know that. I have a sanctified imagination. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Wow. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. There's only one other time, I believe, in the New Testament where this word is used. Your translation may say a charcoal fire. There's only one other time in the New Testament that's used. And oddly enough, we looked at it on Tuesday. Remember when they were gathered around the fire warming themselves? And hey, weren't you one of his disciples? It's a sight of Peter's denial. Scientists tell us that the most powerful sense at evoking memories is the sense of smell. I can be in a very crowded place and if there's, it's usually an older woman, if you're 22 and wear this perfume, don't be insulted, but it's usually an older woman wearing a perfume called white linen, was my mom's favorite. 
we can be in a crowded place. And I'm like, and I can remember conversations with my mom I haven't thought about in years. Ellen's mom died after a 12 year battle with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's and dementia research says sometimes the sense of smell can trigger memories and wake parts of the brain back up. It's a powerful thing. I don't think that's new news to God. He says, bring some of the fish you just caught. Now, isn't that kind of like God? Bring some of the fish you caught, even though he already has fish on the fire. This is one of the paradoxes of the ministry that God chooses to do his work through us when actually he doesn't need us. I, we need to raise three or four million dollars a year for Walk Through the Bible. I used to hate that part of my job because I thought it was my burden to carry as president. And it's like God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can have a barbecue anytime he wants. Now it's like I don't beg for Jesus anymore because he doesn't need it. But instead to go, this is, this is just fantastic what God is doing around the world through the team of Walk Through the Bible. And someday in heaven, you'll thank me that I gave you the opportunity to get in on this action. And I mean that. Now at our major donor conferences, I don't dread the last day anymore. It's actually kind of fun. When they landed, they saw a fire, bring some fish you caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. This is how you know they were real fishermen. That is not a round number. So many of the net was torn. Jesus said to them, come have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Again, I want to ask Simon Peter, how was that meal? He'd probably say, I don't even remember the meal. I doubt he made eye contact with Jesus at all while they were eating. He's, he's estranged. He feels he's failed. He let his good friend down. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Maybe with all the brilliance that there is on this campus, you can tell me what the these refers to. I, I actually can't figure it out. It could be he's referring to the other disciples. Do you really love me more than these? You said you did, but you denied me three times. Or he may be looking at the boats, the nets, the fishing gear, and saying, do you really love me more than these? Because you left all that life, but now you said, I'm going fishing. I tried being a fisher of men, didn't work out. Maybe Jesus be believes in catch and release and he's thrown me back in and I'm going back to something I'm good at and even that then he fails at. And you're gonna experience this at some point in your ministry. Sometimes before Jesus lets us succeed where we've previously failed, he actually makes us fail where we used to succeed. Because he's trying to show us, without me, you can do nothing. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And what does Jesus say? Tell me. Feed my lambs. I've still got work for you to do. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Coincidence that he asked him this three times? In a passage where they count 153 sheep, or sheep, well, that's a good catch. Sheep's head, um, 153 fish. I think numbers matter in this passage. You know, the threefold restoration, I think, fully redeems 
Peter's triple denial. I think that's what's going on here. Jesus says to him, and my father-in-law, who's 91 now in assisted living, he says this is his life verse. Not sure it's the best application of it, but he says this, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are older, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Not sure that's exactly the application any more than when our church painted on the wall of the nursery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not probably <laughs> ideal exegesis going on there. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of truth of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. And friends, becoming a disciple invites us to embrace Christ's forgiveness and follow him like never before. Question, we have anybody here who's Canadian? Yes, I was looking for you. Got anybody else who likes hockey? I don't have to ask him, I just assume that. In, in some ways, hockey is one of the truest representations of how the church functions. It is. Not just the fights. The, you, I, I got that giggle there. Do you know, sometimes God brings discipline. In hockey, discipline is meted out in a very specific place. You know what it's called? The penalty box, that's right. You can be sent away for two minutes, five minutes, even a 10 minute major misconduct. Baseball, even if you get tossed, they put somebody in to replace you. Football, you get ejected from the game, targeting, another player comes in. Hockey, you commit a penalty, you go to the penalty box, your team skates shorthanded. God disciplines. I love to ask people, what percentage of Christians do you think God disciplines? U.S., totally non-Gallup poll, U.S. most common answer I get is 10%. Which is very interesting since scripture clearly says God disciplines all whom he loves. But God has a penalty box. Sometimes he sets people down. In a hockey game, a disproportionate number of goals are scored by the other team while one team has somebody in the penalty box. We call it a power play. It's six on the ice versus five. It's, it's uneven. That's why there's a separate clock that counts down from the two minutes. And when the two minutes is up, you are expected to, to jump out of the penalty box, get back on the ice, and skate. Picture this scene, because this is what happens in our churches. We messed up. God's brought us into a season of discipline. It's not permanent, because failure isn't final, nor is it fatal. But we can get stuck in the penalty box. And I'm telling you, when you go out to serve churches, you will discover a lot of people are stuck in the penalty box. This is one of the reasons in most churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And some of that's the bleachers are just full and they think church is a spectator sport. But some of it is all the men and women who are stuck in the penalty box. Imagine this, you, the time expires and you're still in the penalty box. Your teammates skate by, they slap the boards with sticks like, get out here, we're dying. What is your problem? It's like, no, no, just need to be here a little longer. The ref comes by and goes, son, get on the ice. You served your penalty. Yeah, no, it's for tripping, two minutes. You know, in the first period, I tripped somebody too and you didn't even see it. Think I better sit here a little longer. I've met so many people, some of them that I've tried to recruit to serve God in our church. You know, years ago I told God in high school I was gonna be a missionary, was gonna go to, hoping to go to Brazil. Met a girl, she didn't share my faith and values and she's like, if you're going there, and have a nice trip. She now is on fire for God more than I am. Well, yeah, I need you to lead a home Bible study. You're growing together as a couple. I, I failed God back then. I can't serve him now. I was talking to a woman one time and she says, 
Pastor, I really feel God nudging me to volunteer at the Pregnancy Alternative Center. And I said, you should do it. You're very compassionate. You're a good listener. You're, you're great. You're great with younger women. She goes, I'm not qualified. I said, why is that? She goes, nobody knows this except my husband. She says, but in college I had not one but two abortions. I said, yeah. She says, that's why I can't serve God. She would branded herself with a scarlet A. For others, it's a scarlet D for divorce. Doesn't have to be one of the big ones. There's all sorts of reasons why we decide we can no longer serve God. And I'm not saying there's not consequences and there may be some ministries that it's better that God redirects and puts you a different place. That's all case by case. But you're not supposed to stay in the penalty box forever. That is not the will of God. And some of you, some of you have limited what God wants to do when you walk out of this place because there's something in your past. There's something in your past that you think disqualifies her. I, I said to that woman, as far as I know, she's still ministering there. I said, yeah, wouldn't that be just like God? 2 Corinthians 1, that in the area of you receive comfort, you're most able to comfort others. If you're a young woman and you think you don't have any other choice, she goes, that's, I thought I didn't have a choice. And I said, that's what you get to tell women. There are other options other than that. That's where God gets trophies of grace. There's no story that he cannot redeem. So take that message. Teach John 21 like crazy in your church. Because even in God's discipline, God's judgment, there's always mercy and grace to be found there. And for you, there's something that will change forever in your life if you receive God's forgiveness and you hear him say again, go feed my sheep. Father, thank you for these men and women. Thank you for the example of Simon Peter, Lord, your loving restoration of him. Father, it's so powerful to know that you are a God of second chances and new beginnings. And I pray that you would deliver us from the false guilt that come from the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Yes, you bring discipline, but praise God, you bring restoration. Lord, restore to us the joy of our salvation and let us take that message to a world that desperately needs the freedom only available in Jesus Christ. It is in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen.